We're going to be in the book of Jeremiah this morning. Jeremiah was known by many of his contemporaries as well as uh, those uh, theologians who have studied uh, the Old Testament works. And, and he has been known as the weeping prophet. He's a major prophet, and I want to teach you a little bit about major prophets and minor prophets. It doesn't mean if you are a major prophet in uh, Scripture that you're more important. Major means that your works were longer, that you wrote more. So if you were a minor prophet, you have those little short books, and if you were a major prophet, your, your books were longer within the canonical Bible that we have. Um, much of what Jeremiah writes is kind of doomy and gloomy. He had a really, really rough life. He was imprisoned and beaten and sickened and all kinds of things. And so he's writing from a perspective of doom and gloom, and he's writing from a perspective of the, the words that were being put on his heart by the Lord were ones that typically uh, were uh, some type of condemnation. You'll find in this piece of scripture this morning that this, there is um, an uplifting uh, nature to this piece of scripture. And so let us read from Jeremiah, the 31st chapter, verses 31 through 34. And it reads as follows. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. A covenant they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to one another, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God indeed. That wasn't doomy and gloomy now, was it? It was uplifting. Jeremiah, Jeremiah got himself out of the doom and gloom and... and and really uh, spoke from the heart and, and recorded what the Lord had, had put before him. Uh, this New Testament, this new covenant that he's talking about, we know uh, having uh, foresight and hindsight that that is the New Testament, right? So that's a foretelling of Jesus, this new covenant that Jeremiah writes of. He doesn't specifically name Jesus, nor does he specifically name as a person, but this new covenant that the Lord has put before Jeremiah is really what we call the New Testament in the foretelling of Jesus. We're moving here in what Jeremiah is writing from a legalistic approach to holiness and righteousness, and we're moving to a faith-centered approach to righteousness and salvation. See, remember when Jeremiah is writing and when uh, we are pre-Jesus, we are still subject to the law and everything that is being done in the church has been driven by Mosaic law and all these edicts that have been put out before us. A legalistic approach to faith. You do these things and you're following God. If you want to be in God's favor, you do these things. If you want to stay out of trouble, do these things, right? A legalistic set of rules, the Ten Commandments that we talked about uh, a couple weeks ago, legalistic in structure. And now we're moving to a faith-centered approach to righteousness and salvation. And the reason I changed it from holiness and righteousness with regard to a legalistic approach and calling it faith-centered approach to righteousness and salvation is because this new covenant, right, offers salvation. It offers a way in which we can spend eternity with the Lord without having to follow the laws, which we know from our past sermons we can't do. So Jesus 
becomes this new covenant that is laid out before us in Jeremiah. My dad told me this, and I believe him. Uh, I, I firmly believe this because I've done this throughout my whole academic career, and it's this. If you want to remember something, to accomplish something, or to learn something, write it down. If you want to learn something, if you write it down enough times, you internalize it. And also, there are many uh, self-help people that will tell you a goal is not a goal until you write it down. I say these things to you because in a way, the Lord has told Jeremiah, I'm going to write my law on their heart. Right? I'm going to write it. And once it's written, it's real. You're not listening to me when I'm speaking to you, so now I'm going to write it on you. It's going to be permanent because I'm going to write it on your heart, says the Lord, according to Jeremiah. He also wrote, God wrote the law in their hearts, and therefore, he said, therefore all who believe know him already. So let's try to package up some of this. Jeremiah, who is normally a doom and gloomy kind of guy with regard to his writing, becomes prophetic and becomes uplifting in some of his writing when we get to the 31st chapter, well into a lot of his writing. And the Lord has put it on his heart that he is to inform his readers, inform us, that there's a new, new way of doing things coming. It's not here right now, but it's coming. I'm, go I'm going to, because it says the days are surely coming. So we're looking into the future. Surely the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. So he's telling us, and we know that eventually Jesus comes from the house of David, and that lineage becomes where we find Christ and we find salvation. But Jeremiah is telling us this is coming because the Lord told him, surely the days, says the Lord, are coming that I'm going to make this new covenant with you. So we know Jesus is coming, reading this and knowing our Bible and knowing our New Testament. So we're being set up for the fact that this New Testament is coming. And then we're encouraged by saying, and the Lord puts it before Jeremiah and says, oh, but, you know, remind them that I've tried these kinds of things before and it hasn't worked. I held them by the hand and I walked them out of Egypt in slavery and they still couldn't get it right. So, so now something new's coming. And if you hang on, we'll be in good shape. But until such time, I'm going to start writing what I need them to do and what I want them to do and what my will is. I'm going to write it on their heart. And so what does that really mean? We're going to write it on your heart. Well, I alluded to the fact that if we want to really know something or learn something, we write it down. If we want something to happen, if we want uh, some action, particularly on another person's part, what do we do? We send them an email or we write a memo. I need you. I want you to do these things. Or we write a message to ourselves. Don't forget to, right? We write it down. And so don't let this language get lost in you when the Lord says, through Jeremiah, I'm going to write it on their hearts. And so here's the question I have for you this morning. What's written on your heart? What has the Lord written on your heart? He says he's going to do this, right? We, we say we have a new covenant coming. I say we, Jeremiah writes that. There's a new covenant coming, and, and I'm going to write what I want out of my people, says the Lord. I'm going to write it on their heart. That way it's imprinted on them. So what has he written on your heart? Yes, we have had the blessing of the new covenant. Yes, we know Jesus has come. Yes, we know that our way to salvation in heaven is through Jesus Christ. But we're writing in a pre-Jesus time here. But that doesn't mean, as we have been talking and learning and preaching over the last month and a half or so, 
that it doesn't mean that the Old Testament's invalid. It just means that we're approaching that and we're approaching Christ and we're approaching the Lord differently than we had in the past because we have something more than the law. And so how has he written and what has he written on your heart? I asked that question and I tried to answer it myself and I kind of stumbled and bumbled around mentally as I thought about what that really means. And so some of the things that have kind of been written on my heart, I can't speak to Shonda's heart or Gary's or Coley's or Guy's, Jeremy's. I can speak to my heart though. And one of the things that's been written on my heart with regard to my relationship with the Lord is just an absolute undying love of kids. I do, I have, I always will. I'll be that 85-year-old guy, if the Lord keeps me around that long, still laughing at the kids and trying to get them to do dumb stuff so their parents get upset because that's fun to do, right? I just, I'm wired that way. I guess I'm just a big kid. The Lord really wrote it on my heart. Take care of the children. Be part of the children. Look out for our kids. Be an advocate for our kids. It doesn't mean some people don't like kids, but we all know those people that should not be around children, right? <laughs> <laughs> They're not the kindest folks to kids. That's what he wrote on my heart. And so when I go about ministry and I go about trying to live out my faith the best I can, how I show my faith in the Lord and my adherence to what God has called us to do is I do it through my relationships and my service to and my service with kids. Some people have other types of things that are written on their heart. Some people animals are written on their heart and you'll see people that just they they work in the shelter or they got 75 critters running around or whatever and it's written on their heart that they're going to take care of of the animals and they're going to be part of that some people it's written on their heart that they it just pains them uh, a brother of ours up the road at another church if you want to see him get teary-eyed don't feed people he really, it really, really bothers the brother when folks are food insecure. It just eats at his heart. He would sell his vehicle to feed another person. That's just how it is. The Lord put it on his heart that the way he needs to serve and the way that he needs to adhere to God's will is that it's written on his heart, you shall do so through uh, service to people who can't find something to eat and can't find a place to live. That's how it's written. You know and I know there are people that should not go to homeless shelters and help feed the homeless. Right? They're just not wired that way. It doesn't come off very well. And it, it, it we got to serve the Lord, right, with a pure and joyful heart. And so if you're doing something that's not your, in your lane, your, your ministry, your faith, your, your relationship with the Lord doesn't get magnified the way it should be. So what's written on your heart? And how is it written on your heart? Because we know why it's written on your heart. It's written on your heart because as we had talked about, God just realized he couldn't trust us on our own to adhere to his will and pleasure. He had to find another way. So he's telling Jeremiah who he's used in the past to warn people and kind of cajole people and try to jerk a knot in their tail. Here he gives Jeremiah words of encouragement and direction so that he could pass them along in a way that we're not necessarily accustomed to in his writing. So at the end of this, how does it all get packaged up? The Lord, through Jeremiah, is trying to pave the way for a new mindset. Because we have been inundated, and we even know that as Jesus grows in his ministry, he spends a lot of time where? In the synagogues, right? Doesn't he spend a lot of time with the learned people of the Jewish faith? So even Jesus is a real scholar and has a great deal of knowledge about the Old Testament and the, and 
the uh, requirements through Mosaic law and the uh, and in the realm of sacrifices and all the things that thou shalt do these things and thou shalt not do these things and you will be in my good graces. You will I will call you my people, says the Lord. Right. So the Lord is using Jeremiah as he used some other prophets to kind of tell folks we're going to do something. We're going to try something new. We've been going down this path a while and it hasn't worked. I've been telling you what not to do and what to do and how to do it. And you're not following along. So now we're going to have a new covenant, a new way, a new kind of time and thought process about how we're going to do this. And we end up with Jesus. And I'm thankful that we do. And how I want you to reconcile this in your own mind this morning and in your own life is be thankful of Jeremiah and his writing to us and his instruction to us and his foretelling that there is going to be a new way, a new covenant. And also be thankful that we live in a post-Jesus world where we know that that new covenant was fulfilled because Christ came. Something that Jeremiah didn't get to experience. But we did and we do. That new covenant is in the body and in the name and in the ministry and in the sacrifice and the death, the resurrection and the promise to come again of Jesus Christ. And we know that. But we still need to reconcile this writing of the law on our heart. I bounce this off of uh, a person who uh, is not a theologian. And they said, well, I can tell you what that really means, Cam. It really means that stuff that's written on your heart is the little voice that tells you don't do that or do this. Or it tells you, hey, man, you, you're really good at that. You should really do this. And I said, you mean like the little angel and devil on your shoulder? And he goes, well, I try not to have that devil, but you know what I mean. Yeah. It's the things that we inherently know, right? Thou shalt and thou shalt not. And when you marry those with the knowledge uh, that our faith in Jesus Christ provides and reveals salvation to us, man, that's pretty awesome. And that's how we should reconcile it. We should reconcile all that Old Testament thou shalt and thou shalt not and really embrace them, but not necessarily embrace them in a legalistic form where, wow, you're in trouble if you don't do those, but look at them that we're moving from a legalistic form to one that, that's, that's based in a faith-centered movement now. Isn't it good that you don't have to go through all of the scripture and say, ooh, I didn't do that and I should have done this and I did do that. What we now do is, is that we say we move through this day and we should just be thankful in it and blessed in it. And at the end of the day, Lord, I know I'm a sinner and I screwed up and I know that I'm not in perfect concert with your will and your way, but I have Jesus. And because I have Jesus, all that other stuff, while I try, I'm still forgiven. And boy, is that a great new covenant. I am so blessed and thankful, and I pray that you are too, that we didn't live in the pre-Jesus time where we were going to have to toe the line knowing full well, and God knowing full well, we couldn't do it. We were being set up for failure. Now, don't go and say that my pastor said that the Lord tried to set us up for failure, but in our own minds, we're kind of looking at that going, Man, we can never do that. I'm going to put this in context for you. And then I'm going to wrap up the sermon. There is nothing worse, right, than having a boss or a teacher or a parent give you a challenge that there is some reward at the end of it if you make it, right? And then you know halfway through it, you're never going to get there. All right? So let me put this in context for you. Look now, I will take you to the movies if you can get your room cleaned up 
in 30 minutes. And the kid knows, looking at the room, that's not going to happen in 30 minutes. And the parent may be just trying to motivate them and going to take them to the movies anyway. But what do most folks do once they realize that 30 minutes is almost up? They give up, right? They throw up their hands and say, I can't do it. There's nothing that irks me more than people, particularly educators, and I'm one of those, who give kids some kind of goal, and then when it becomes untenable, and they know they're not going to make it, that there's no leniency or no redirection. The kid then knows, well, okay, I can't read that much. Or the kid goes and says, there's no way that I'm going to get uh, 15 more problems done, so I'm not going to get the candy bar, so you know what? I ain't doing anymore. Or you lose hope. Or you lose faith. And so, sometimes, I can envision myself in a pre-Jesus world where I go and I look and I'm like, I'm never getting that. I'm never getting to heaven. I'm never going to see the Lord because I can't do that. I can't do that. I've already lied twice this week, so I'm out. I took something that wasn't mine. I was kind of hungry, and that donut looked good. I took that. All right, I'm out. And so you start looking around, and eventually you do what? You start to what? Rebel. And what did people do? What did the nation of Israel do to the Lord? They rebelled. Because they saw no hope. Because they knew they couldn't make perfection. And so Jesus comes into the picture in this new covenant because the Lord said, these children need help. They do need a Savior. So the end of the sermon is what, Janie? You need help. And you need a Savior. I'm thankful that Jeremiah gave some encouragement to the people of whom he was writing to and preaching to and studying with. And I'm thankful that the Lord followed through on what he said he was going to do. Which was he was going to provide us with a new covenant. He was going to write his law on our heart. And he was going to provide us a savior. And we're no longer going to have to teach all the time. What? Teach one another. Know the Lord. Because he said we are going to already know him. Think about what's written on your heart this week, church. Where is God calling you to work in your life? Where is God calling you to serve? Where is God calling you in your prayer life? And surely the days are coming when I will make with the house of Israel a new covenant. I am glad, I am blessed, and I'm thankful that the Lord said that. Amen? Amen.